All right, I see some people are joining us here for our Ask CDI live event, which is great. And we'll get we'll officially get started right at seven. Um, but if anyone is joining us here who would like to add in a comment so I know where you're joining from or anything you'd like to share, that would be great. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you, Roy Louis. And welcome, Sam. Welcome, Jen. Yeah, this is a new thing for me, so it's kind of exciting to be talking live with people in a way, although I see your comments and don't get to see you, unfortunately, but. <laughs> and hello, welcome, Lori. Crystal and Chris, hello. from Uxbridge, Tanya and Francis. Thanks for joining. So I think we'll get started and as um, people might come and go and that's okay, um, but I will just introduce myself here and talk a little bit about how this evening's session will go. Um, so my name is Dr. Nora Klemensik. I'm a psychologist who works at CDI, Child Development Institute. And since graduating in 2011, I have worked with children and adolescents uh, in a, a few different settings. So community-based mental health, as well as hospital and private practice settings. And I have seen many, many children and adolescents who struggle with anxiety and so today's session and talk, um, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about supporting anxious children and youth. And in particular, it seems like a fitting time to talk about it because of what we're all going through right now with COVID-19, the pandemic, um, heightened levels of anxiety that we're seeing in uh, most people, many people, not just kids, but it's a uh, time of anxiety and uncertainty for many. So um, I think what the format is meant to be such that you guys can ask questions and let me know if you have any anything you would like me to speak on uh, in that within that topic area. And just as a general comment at the beginning, I think there's a comment. My I have a moderator helping me out here this evening, which is great. Thank you. Um, who mentions that um, we're, this is an informational session, really, and so it's not meant to be a psychological uh, service, of course, or any kind of intervention for specific children or families. So uh, I can give general information and general 
comments and ideas uh, that, that have to do with supporting anxious kids. So um, please feel free to, I'm going to try and, I've never done this before, but I'm going to try and kind of talk and look back and check, check for questions as I go. So uh, bear with me if I miss a question or if I seem like I don't know what I'm doing, that could be. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll start just by talking a little bit about anxiety in general and maybe anxiety in within this time of um, within this pandemic and if questions come across you know in your mind just let me know and I can I can try and answer so in general when we think about anxiety with children and adolescents we have to remember that really it's very normal um, anxiety isn't a feeling that we most of us if not all of us you know have from time to time and it's not a problem it's not a bad thing it's a very a very human feeling um, and it can really help us and not it's not dangerous to be anxious and it can be quite adaptive to hold us back from doing things that might hurt us or or cause us injury um, so when we're talking about anxiety again just in general anxiety gets heightened and worsens when we're faced with things that are uncertain so if there's new things or changes things that are unpredictable situations that are ambiguous we don't really know what what the information means when we we think about those kinds of factors where we expect to see more anxiety and more anxious feelings so when we think about COVID-19 and this pandemic it fits pretty much all of those criteria actually it's very uncertain we're living in times when we don't know what to expect exactly we don't know we're trying to predict all the time as humans we like to know what's going to happen and be able to predict uh, as accurately as we can what's going to happen and with this situation we really just can't and that can be very tough and makes anxiety it can make anxiety worse for many of us um, for those children and teens who had quite high levels of anxiety or perhaps even anxiety disorders before this pandemic we would expect things to potentially get worse unfortunately for those those youth and kids and for those who might not have really shown signs of excessive anxiety before the situation we might see that they start showing more signs of anxiety now and we just anecdotally have seen that in families we work with that children show signs of excessive or more anx anxious behavior than they might have in the past so maybe getting a little more clingy with their parents not wanting to leave you know their parents side um, having any kind of physical troubles such as maybe having trouble with eating or sleeping or um, unexplained pains you know in their stomach or headaches that kind of thing um, or more irritability and frustration and disobedience I guess uh, for lack of a better way of putting it just that you know not listening to parents all of these kinds of behaviors can be increasing or we might have seen them increase in our kids over the last couple of months um, and you know kids have really had their entire worlds um, changed and topsy-turvy over the last little while just as much as adults so it can be a very anxiety provoking time for them especially so I'm looking over here I don't see any questions yet but please do feel free like if anyone has questions specifically um, or related to anxiety I'm happy to happy to talk about those too um, I can be long-winded and talk just by myself about lots of things but that's probably not as interesting as if you if you have some ideas um, you'd like me to discuss so please do 
Um, I did look up a little bit of information about anxiety, you know, research that has been done, or I guess surveys is, is more accurate way to put it, that have been done about anxiety and anxiety rates in Canada and around the world um, lately. And um, it seems that overall Canadians are having higher levels of anxiety, but these aren't really child or adolescent specific kinds of statistics. So um, it's, it's hard to know what we'll find in the months after the pandemic is, is kind of resolved. Researchers are, are still kind of in the middle of it and don't have great studies and understanding of mental health issues right now and how they're going to play out. Um, okay, so I see a couple of questions that are coming in. Oh yeah, so I've got one. Should I become, should I be concerned because my daughter's anxiety seems to be lessened during this time? Oh, um, well, I would say no. I, I think that's actually, that's okay. Um, some kids, they find the, the you know, being out of school uh, takes a big level of stress off of them because they've, maybe school could be a source of quite a bit of stress and anxiety for some kids. And so if they're feeling, not feeling that extra uh, pressure of school or any other kinds of parts of their routine that might have been um, somewhat stressful for them, that that's okay. Um, in that case, they're having a little bit of a, a little bit of a reprieve, I guess, from that. Um, Okay, and what if a child is too scared to go outside? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so children who are probably more anxious, have more anxious temperaments in general, um, can become, as we mentioned, more anxious and seeing all the people outside wearing masks or being afraid of coming within a certain distance of other people can make some kids uh, more anxious about going out at all. So what I think the, one of the main general principles to keep in mind about helping kids with anxiety is that we are trying to help kids do things that are fearful to them and to go outside of the comfort zone and face fears and be brave. Now, when we're talking about, you know, doing these kinds of things during a pandemic, I have to caution and say, we don't want to start pushing children to do new things if they're feeling much more stressed than, than ever before. It's not really the right time to start building, you know, exposure ladders and doing more, more uh, facing fears more and more. But that being said, if there's something that, like getting outside, is quite a uh, healthy thing to do, and it's good to be able to, especially in the, as the weather is getting nicer in Ontario, uh, parts of Ontario anyway, um, you know, being able to go outside is really, could be quite important and help with family functioning. So I would say it's okay to, to um, work on, depending on the age of the child, work on facing the fear and being brave, even though you don't really want to. So trying things like going out in the back, on the back porch, for example, if going out on the street is too hard, um, going out on the balcony, going out for a little, a little while and coming home. So doing kind of little small steps of bravery to go outside and face the fear would be something that could be recommended. Younger children can sometimes benefit from hearing stories about bravery too. So, you know, stories about the child who was really afraid of going out and getting sick, but they learn to do things to keep them and their family safe, like wash their hands or stay a little bit distant from people when they're outside, those kinds of things. And they could be, they ended up being able to be brave and go out and have fun with their friends and sort of have a positive ending to it. So that kind of storytelling and helping kids to develop a brave identity, an, an identity as a child, as someone who can be courageous and do the things that are fearful to them. That's one of the most important things we can do for kids who are anxious, in fact. Um, okay, so how to handle meltdowns. 
as we're seeing more of them. Oh, and anxiety driven in specific. So yeah, this is very difficult because as I was saying, you know, earlier kids and parents too are under so much more stress often, not everyone, as I think another comment mentioned, um, but often the stress levels have heightened for families. And so the way that children's stress and distress kind of comes out can be in different ways. So melt, melting down or having a big sort of temper tantrum or um, crying and screaming, that kind of thing can be a sign of real distress. And, and as you're mentioning in your comment here that it seems anxiety driven, that it's really about not wanting to be, um, to feel anxious. So one of the things I guess it's kind of important to understand in the situation is what um, kind of anxiety, where it's coming from, and also I guess the age of the child would help me know a little bit more. Um, because we want to be able to empathize and validate, we call it, children's feelings to show that we understand what they're going through or doing our best to understand that. And so if we are trying to help validate or empathize with emotions, um, that can sometimes help the child to feel a bit calmer or, or know that someone really sees and hears them. Um, and then from there, depending on the kind of meltdown and the kind of situation, again, sometimes we um, can, if it's not a, like a really big one, sometimes we can ignore it, or even if it is a big one, it depends on the situation. Sometimes it can be helpful to um, address the emotion. It's, oh, well, it's always helpful to address the emotion, but then sometimes it can be helpful to work on doing something to calm down and feel safer and calmer Sometimes it's okay to just give space and allow someone to, you know, let that intense emotion kind of ride out um, and to not accidentally reward it, we call it, or reinforce it so that sometimes by accident we do things that make children more likely to melt down in the future because of um, different ways we react. So some of the things I, I would recommend would be things like as I mentioned, trying to empathize and validate and find ways to help a child calm down and take space and take a break. Um, okay, so another question we talked have here is about rage and balancing rage meltdowns without punishing. Oh yeah, and trying to be empathetic, that's excellent. That's a good, a good step. And when things get unsafe, oh yes, yeah, so this can be a really tricky situation because if your child is doing something that's unsafe or could be um, destructive, um, you want to make sure, of course, that people are physically safe. That's number one. Um, but also teaching them how to manage feelings. So this is actually probably quite, this, this might even be a more uh, in-depth conversation that we could even get to today into today but I would say some of the things um, that you're already talking about are really important because you're talking about trying to make sure that we don't punish children for having intense emotions because it's okay to have any emotion really what we really want to make sure is that when you have an intense emotion you are not doing something that could hurt yourself or hurt someone else or destroy property so making sure that kids have that clear boundary on what is and isn't okay. Um, and then the other, I guess, important thing to consider is how to help the situation not get to the point where it's unsafe. And that's 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 the tricky part. Um, but again, I think that's that's a really good, I think lots of parents struggle with that and that's a really good a good, um, you know, question to maybe bring even to if there was someone working with your child professionally, um, you know, to, to kind of get into the nitty gritty of each situation and what might have been triggering or causing or preceding the, the big emotions and then how to consistently um, handle it so that your child does feel like you understand and you get it and that you're keeping them safe and not letting them hurt anyone at the same time. Um, 
So hopefully that's not that's not the most practical answer, maybe, but <laughs> that's that's a complicated situation for sure. Um, okay, and then can a child outgrow anxiety, or is it a lifetime condition? So, from what we know about intense, excessive anxiety that could be considered like an anxiety disorder, uh, the I guess simple answer is that no, you don't really outgrow that. That does that doesn't kind of dissipate on its own typically. Um, so if a child is showing really severe anxiety and it's impacting on their life and it's it's impairing their functioning, they're not able to do the things that they really enjoy or that they want to be able to do in life, or it's even impacting on the family's functioning, um, then it would be important to likely to consult with a professional, a mental health professional um, in your community, could be a family physician as a first point of contact to find out what kinds of resources might be available for, for treating the anxiety because we know it doesn't really go away um, on its own. We have excellent treatments and ways to treat anxiety and intense anxiety in kids and it's one of those things that we actually do know a lot about how to help, um, help with it, but um, we, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't tend to just go off, go away on its own, unfortunately. Um, okay, and do you feel it's appropriate for young children to listen to news? And are they able to process and truly understand the idea of a pandemic? So I guess it probably depends on what we're talking about in terms of young. Um, Probably younger children aren't going to really understand it, no, um, especially if we're talking like kindergarten or younger. Um, so listening to the news may not be helpful. I think I would I would take the cue from the child, and if the child seems really, um, you know, because some kids they'll listen to the, they're sort of the news is on, they're not listening because it's the the words and vocabulary and whatever's happening is above their above their heads. Um, but if you have a child who's kind of listening in and then saying like, oh my gosh, people are dying or, you know, they're, they're seeming, I, I don't think they need to listen to it. No. Um, so, you know, especially if you have a very anxious child who, um, when, when people are prone to anxiety, they're tending to have what we call catastrophic kinds of thoughts. So, you know, it's, it's not just, oh, you know, I forgot to wash my hands. I better wash them now. It's like, I forgot to wash my hands. Maybe I got everyone I love sick and maybe they're all going to die and everyone I know and love is going to die. Like that's kind of where our minds go when we're feeling anxious. So it's very difficult for young children to um, process and understand certain information in the news, I would say. So I think it's okay to just limit that for younger kids. Um, and then, okay, this is the age of a child. All right, so let me go back to, oh yeah, so ha mel handling meltdowns who, for a seven-year-old. Yeah, so this is this is a, a, a quite a young age still. And seven, we're kind of seeing a little bit, I mean, self-awareness is kind of developing over those middle school years, uh, or middle, sorry, middle childhood years. <laughs> and uh, at that age, um, having having kind of meltdowns and things it might be something that your child feels embarrassed about if especially if it were ever happening kind of outside or where other people could see them um, but I do think kind of my comments before about trying to find out a little bit more about if we can um, doing a little bit of an analysis of what is leading up to those meltdowns and how to um, you know try and help our child feel, our children feel more safe and secure and also um, allowing them to do things that are a little bit outside of their comfort zone at times as well. Um, is anxiety common in children with ASD? So ASD, I'm going to say, I'm going to say is autism spectrum disorder. Um, and anxiety is very common in children with ASD, so more common than in the in the average or the um, typically developing population, actually. So, at least fifty percent of children with ASD will have very high levels of anxiety. Um, 
some studies show even more than that. So yes, it's it's highly it's very common. Yeah. Okay, and then the next one is anxiety a learned condition, and does it run in families? Um, okay, so anxiety. Uh, Okay, I can first say it does run in families. Yes, so there is a there is a, a heritable. It, 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 there's a component there that's quite heritable, and children who have anxiety disorders will often have parents who have high levels of anxiety as well. It's not a perfect, you know, correlation, but yes, they do, it does run in families. And then, is it a learned condition? That's a little more tricky to answer. Um, anxiety is because it's it's. Uh, an emotion that we feel, or a, a it's uh, it, there's a cultural component to it. So how we understand our feelings when our when when our body has a, an anxious reaction. So that just means that our nervous system is getting more hyped up, and so we might have our hearts beat, we might sweat, we might be short of breath, we might have all these physical sensations that are related to an anxious anxious state. Um, but that state in itself isn't actually isn't actually the only isn't anxiety on its own because that that state of feeling kind of flush, sweaty, having your heart race, whatever, those that's just a, a state that's getting us ready to action, and it can also be associated with things like anxiety. I mean, anxiety, uh, like excitement. So, for example, if I come on to this Facebook Live event and I'm feeling, oh my gosh, I haven't done this before, I'm feeling anxious, then you know. That, that's one way of interpreting my body's signals to me. The other way I could interpret would be, oh, I, you know, oh, I'm about to do this like awesome Facebook Live event and I've never done it before and I'm kind of excited to you know, see how it's going to go. And if I'm interpreting it in a different way, then, I, then I'm arguably not really feeling anxiety or experiencing anxiety. I'm experiencing excitement, but it's the same kind of feeling inside me um, physically. So... It, so in some sense, we do sort of learn through our culture experiences and through different um, experiences we have in our lives about what is anxiety, you know, what, what that feeling is for us. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of, oh, and, and I guess I could also say that we also, our anxious feelings can also um, be sort of inadvertently um, heightened or our anxiety can become worse based on what people around us do. So as children, if our parents do certain things, we kind of know there's like some things that have been shown in research to not help um, anxiety and, and even worsen it inadvertently. Parents aren't intending to do this. But so there's some factors like that. So if we think about anxiety being um, something learned, there are components to it that can be learned and that can can make it kind of worse or, or better. But on the other hand, some people are just born with a more sensitive temperament. And so we do understand that too, that some kids are just more naturally anxious and more naturally worried. And when they start being able to, to think in words, they start having all these worries and thoughts that sometimes parents are kind of thinking, I've never worried about that ever. And here is my child constantly worrying about everything. So. We know that there's there are aspects that are learned from parent or inherited. We know there are aspects that are learned. It's kind of a complicated story. <laughs> I hope that that's helpful. Um, okay. I have a seven-year-old daughter who has regressed and is afraid to go anywhere without me, including the bedtime and bathroom. So, any suggestions on how I can alleviate her fears? Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so this is a a I think anecdotally kind of common sign of increased anxiety that we're seeing over this time when schedules are thrown off and people are, you know, kids aren't in preschool or school as they normally are. Um, so one thing I would say about this is you can gently, and I, and I think it's fair to say that you are going to probably need to provide more reassurance and more comforting and more and um, sort of allow your child to be a bit more clingy for, you know, to use that language, um, it's okay right now because it's very stressful for kids and parents. Um, and kids do, 
might need that extra reinsurance that we might normally not need to provide. Um, on the other hand, we can probably do some things to, as I was talking about before, kind of help our child develop a bit of a brave or courageous kind of identity and a feeling that I can do it and it's really hard, but yet I can still do it. And so, um, you know, gently kind of mentioning things to your child about how it would be brave to state, you know, not come with me to the bathroom or, um, you know, it would be really, it's really brave to, you know, go to bed on your own. Like those kinds of things you can, you can mention, talk about in story form. Sometimes that can be really helpful for kids, again, to hear about other kids who are really afraid to go to sleep without their parent because it was so, they felt so anxious, they felt so worried, you know, giving them names and words to use for their emotions can be a really helpful thing. Um, and so you're gently encouraging bravery, doing things you normally don't do, doing new things, and um, as a parent, modeling yourself doing those things too. That can be very, very helpful. Because if you're a parent who says, oh my gosh, I'm never going to do anything new, I'm not going to try anything outside my comfort zone, but I really want my child to do that, it might not go so well. Because children, of course, watch what we do and not really, they don't listen so well to what we say often. <laughs> okay. Um, I imagine there will be heightened anxieties when school resumes with new protocol and are there any suggestions on how to handle and prepare anxious children? Um, sure, so I think we can, we can prepare anxious children by talking with them depending on their age. If they're a bit older, we can, they'll have more sort of intellectual or cognitive ability to be able to do this. Um, and we can talk with them more about what they're, um, what's going to happen, what they expect to happen preparing them for if we already know ahead of time and hopefully um, preschools and schools will let us know you know what the new protocols might be and so we can talk about that with kids and what they how they feel about that does that make them more nervous does that make them less nervous you know um, I think discussing it ahead of time can be really helpful with with some kids and also um, you can always you know, start working on those things a little bit at home too. So if, if you don't have any hand washing, well, hopefully most of us or all of us have hand washing going on right now, at, you know, um, when we come inside and those kinds of things. But if you're not really doing, if you're not really washing your hands after, I don't know, touching your face or something, you could try practicing that at home um, to, you know, prepare ahead of time that, okay, this is what you're going to be doing when you go back to school. So let's make sure we do it here too, just to practice and kind of make it into a game if you want. Pretend you're going to school, that kind of thing. Um, and then lots more separation anxiety with seven-year-old daughter. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's been a very common one. Um, there's a kind of fear. It's, it's probably not, well, it's not rational, you know, lots of worries and anxieties are aren't rational or uh, making a lot of sense intellectually, but just that sense of being kind of unsafe and that we want to be close to our loved ones. I think that's coming out a lot. Um, okay, are you aware of increased anxiety in children with celiac disease? Oh, um, that's a good question. Just as a population in general, do children with celiac disease have higher anxiety rates? I'm not sure on that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised about that because I do know there are some data about things like um, asthma and allergies that relate to especially breathing, um, being having some higher rates of anxiety in some research. So it's possible that children who have a um, you know potentially very harmful, uh, very severe allergy such as celiac disease could be more at risk for anxiety. Um, Sorry, I don't know the statistics on that one. Okay. Um, if your child develops a new self-soothing technique, for example, chewing on a shirt collar, should I try to should I address and try to correct it or let it go, particularly now? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so my my kind of sense is it's it might be just nice to let it go because it is such a stressful time and some and probably some of us are doing things that we normally don't do to you know cope and and um, cope with our stress 
And I don't think um, some of the some of the behaviors we're seeing children do right now, we don't know that those are going to continue on once the environment changes and once things are back into a more regular pattern for kids. So um, I I don't want to get too nervous or or uh, work too hard to change behaviors that are coming up now, uh, knowing that they could just be a temporary reaction to this very stressful um, environment we're going through. Um, okay, so how do you approach talking about anxiety within themselves? I've heard not giving it attention is important, but it's hard not to. So how do you discuss how do you discuss them with them? Um, so maybe Emily, can you clarify for me? Do you mean how do you approach uh, talking about how they're feeling anxious? Is that what you mean? I'll just wait maybe to give Emily a minute to, to get back to me, just so I make sure I'm answering the right part of the question. Um, to not, so, you know, should we be talking about anxious feelings or worries with our kids? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the main answer is yes. You, you can absolutely speak about worries and anxieties with kids. The problem that comes up, and maybe this could be partly what you're talking about or thinking about, is that when we when kids need a lot of reassurance and they kind of seek reassurance again and again and we get into these very long conversations about anxieties um, that that can be not so helpful so you know if kids are asking um, are you going to die of coronavirus or something and they keep asking and asking and asking and you've already discussed you know the, the facts that your child needs to know about the situation and used trying to use their age appropriate um, language and all of that um, and they're still continuing to ask and trying to have more conversations about it then yes it can become um, helpful to ignore kind of really excessive reassurance seeking at times um, so I, I'm not sure if that's that's kind of what you're referring to uh, but that can be that can be um, a tricky balance right now as well, knowing that we probably do need to reassure and kind of, um, you know, be more physically uh, present and be more um, aware of our children's stress at this time. Um, ignoring and ignoring negative behavior while they're dealing with it. Yeah, um, so like ignoring excessive anxiety can be, can be helpful. It can be a helpful technique or, or way to handle things at times, but it, it um, needs to happen within a very, very warm, um, empathic, understanding relationship with your child. So you have to, so, so hopefully your child feels that you do understand how difficult and um, hard it is to be feeling how anxious they're feeling and to, to understand that, that emotion they're having. Um, and then if there's times when there's, when they're trying to, I guess, feel less anxious by, by talking about things a lot or doing something, doing something we don't want them to be doing, um, then sometimes it can be helpful to be, to be ignoring that. Okay, and hair pulling and skin pinching. Oh, I see. Yeah, so kind of like compulsive behavior in a sense or something that the child is doing to, to um, self-soothe, but it's not, not necessarily helpful. Yeah. Um, and then someone's written a comment here. Try to get outdoors and hike a trail and get them outside. And it helps my grand and myself and get out to nature. Yeah, and being outside and helping your grandchild. That's really wonderful. That's a like, very positive thing to do, for sure. And we know that one of the things to really help with anxiety is physical activity and physical exercise.
So, okay, we're getting, we're, we only have a few minutes left, I think, before the end of our time here. Um, is there any other question people had that they wanted that I didn't get to or that I maybe didn't understand quite properly that you'd like to share before the end? Just let me know. Okay, and then there's a question here. Oh, we're struggling with defiance with our six-year-old son. Any advice? Okay, so yes, defiance is another is kind of a whole other area because if it's um, related to anxiety, then it can be a different kind of way of handling it and, and dealing with it. Um, but one of the one of the sort of more important things when it comes to defiant or oppositional behavior is um, working really hard on um, relationship and, and, and um, helping, helping your child know their, uh, or feel like their emotions and feelings are really being understood and that you're really well connected. So the kind of relationship um, piece can be so key. Um, and so that's, I, it's a whole other talk. I could actually, you know, talk about defiance for a whole other, um, session, but that's that's one, one piece I would say is that it's really important. That's kind of the, the foundation is that if a child feels understood, heard um, by their by their caregiver, then there's a way then from there um, things can uh, you know different strategies can be tried to help um, improve that defiance and that really oppositional behavior um, even with really young kids. Um, and then, okay, I think I'll take, all right, I think I'll take these last um, two questions that are up here. Well, we'll see. I'll see if I can, how fast I can get to them. Okay, so our four-year-old has had many tantrums and resistance to eating at meal times. Could this be related to our weird grocery wiping? Uh, well, certainly if you, if you saw that that relationship, like your child wasn't having tantrums and resistance before meals and then you started wiping groceries and they started that tantrum, tantruming at mealtimes, that seems logical, it could be. Um, and, you know, it's it's hard to know because again, that, that wiping of the groceries, I'm guessing, kind of coincided with a lot of other changes and um, uncertainties that kind of came at the same time for your four-year-old. So potentially differences in who's in the home every day, and maybe I don't know if your child was in, in childcare, but again, that idea that your your everything in your life is new and changed and unpredictable um, that can really affect emotions in general and have and cause a lot of stress. So it could be that particular you know wiping of the groceries. It could be that that coincided with all this other stress in life. Um, but if you think it is because of the grocery ripening and you want to just experiment and try not allowing your child to see that and see what happens, if possible, that could be a good experiment to just notice how your child's reacting and how your child's, um, if your child's emotions are intensifying or not when you, when you change your, your behavior. Um, Okay, and how often is safe to give sleep aid and melatonin is a supplement I use? Okay, so actually I, I won't um, give any kind of comments or advice on um, medication or I know melatonin is a, is a supplement, it's not a prescription uh, medication, but I will, I, I unfortunately can't really give comments on that since I don't have a medical background. So I would just suggest speaking to your uh, physician about that one. Um, Okay, and then what if you yourself are very, very anxious? How do you not make the child anxious related to the grocery question? Well, that's, yeah, that's true. So if you're the one, if you as a parent are feeling very, very anxious, then your child will certainly pick up on that. Um, maybe not verbally, but they, they'll feel that intense emotion from you. Um, we do actually have another CDI live event coming up in, I think, towards the end of June. I'm trying to see my notes here. Um, 
with another one of our psychologists, our fine psychologist, uh, Dr. Sam Yamada. And yeah, that's the end of June 25th. And she'll be talking about self-care for caregivers. So that I think actually would be a good one for that conversation just about, because it's a much, it's a, again, a, a very wide, we could talk about that for another hour. Just how do you take care of yourself as a parent? Because your own self-care and your own ability to be compassionate with yourself and show um, courage and model calmness and, you know, handling negative emotions, all of that influences your child's behavior a lot. So that I think would be great if anyone can tune into that one. Um, Dr. Yamato will talk about that. Um, yeah, and then maybe he's reacting to your stress level. It's, that's very true. Or normal four-year-olds, yep. And okay, thanks for putting up those parent resources. We have someone in our our uh, feed here. Okay, thanks for yeah, thanks guys. And I think one thing I'll just ask maybe our moderator. Um, thanks so much, Baden, for helping out here. And if you don't mind putting up a few links because to um, anxiety specific resources. So one I really like to use is um, anxietycanada.com, and. Um, it just has so many, so many resources and so much information about how to handle anxiety and how to help kids be braver and do things that are um, outside of their, you know, comfort zone, facing fears. Um, and there's also some uh, links to relaxation and uh, child-friendly mental imagery kind of tracks that I would also suggest. Uh, Mind Masters 2 is the program's name, and I think it's through Ottawa Public Health now that um, you can see, uh, d download these tracks free to um, help with kids. It's four to nine year olds. It's kind of the target age. So some of those free online resources can be um, quite good, really, really well done. So I'd recommend those. Okay, and just as, as people are leaving here, let me just mention too that our next CDI, Ask CDI Facebook Live event will be on June 11th at 7 p.m. again. And this one, we're gonna have our CEO, Lynn Ryan McKenzie and David Willis, who's the director of Toronto's Lead Agency for Children's Mental Health. They'll be on together to discuss the topic of accessing mental health services, navigating the Toronto child and youth mental health system. So that might be very interesting for people in the Toronto area, especially to hear more about navigating what can sometimes feel like a very unwieldy mental health system um, for parents. So I recommend you guys tune in and, and uh, come to our next events. So yes, thanks so much everyone. It was a real pleasure to be able to chat with you and answer some questions and I hope uh, people were able to take away some something useful from this. And um, I wish you all the best, stay well, stay safe, and thanks again. <laughs>